Thank you. Welcome. My name's Sam Drury. I'm UX Director at UIC Digital. And I'm Laura Llewellyn, Creative Director of Digital News and Streaming at BBC Studios. Sam and I are here today to talk to you about a tiny task we took on of redesigning one of the world's largest news websites for a global audience. Now, condensing the last two and a half years into 20 minutes might seem like a challenge in itself. Luckily, though, we come from a long history of storytelling. For those of you less familiar with who the BBC is, here's a little bit of context. Mr. President, Clive Murray, pleasure to meet you. This border has become highly politicised. The war in this area is extremely active. The presence of international media is rare here. These were the voices he felt were unheard. There's a new king! Don't you feel an obligation, a duty? Humanity's approach is really not working. All they want is unity. Curiosity is one of the driving forces of mankind. Um, a very emotional statement has just come through, in fact. As you can see, the BBC has a wider mission and purpose of being the first global public service broadcaster. And in a year where over 2 billion people are going to be voting, and you might say democracy is at stake, redesigning a platform that brings trusted, unbiased news and factual content to a wider audience in a more relevant and powerful way couldn't feel like a more important brief, or honestly, sometimes a bit of a daunting one. So in the UK, the BBC has a long, long history of storytelling, over 100 years, in fact. But today, we're going to tell the story of how we redesigned, rebranded, and completely rebuilt from scratch BBC.com for a global audience, not just for those in the UK. So as you can see from the variety of design treatments here, the way the BBC has brought its content to audiences online has evolved quite significantly. Having launched .co.uk in 1997, um, the, audience, the international audiences have received quite periodic exports of very UK-centric websites, all of which have been designed for an audience with a really deeply ingrained relationship with the BBC. However, as a British person that lives in America, I soon found that international audiences don't necessarily always have that association with the brand that I do. And understanding that difference between an international audience in the UK was going to be crucial to the success of this project. So in the UK, the BBC is like oxygen. It's, it's all around you. You just kind of absorb it. You get introduced to it at childhood, and it basically stays with you for the whole of your life. But as I found, having conversations with friends in the US, you often hear things like, oh, the BBC, that means the World Service Radio, right? Or, oh, you mean that David Attenborough guy? And those differences in perspective were really starting to be reflected in our product experience. So up until 2022, and we took on this product and project, international audiences were receiving kind of an a la carte offering of our product experience with slightly mismatched dishes, rather than a more coherent, elevated tasting menu experience. New sections had either been inherited from .co.uk or been created specifically for international audiences and kind of just added on, not necessarily considering how it fit with the rest of the product experience. And this, as you can see, basically led to a whole load of different design treatments, a wide range of templates and layouts we had, quite inconsistent branding, different typographic styles. We found out that we, had, we were using something like nine different CMS platforms to populate all of this. And ultimately, it, it led to a fragmented, inconsistent user experience, and quite notably, quite a confusing relationship that the public had with the BBC brand. So you could say BBC.com had really started to lose its identity. So it was time for a reset. The business recognized that we needed to be more intentional about our international endeavors in order to achieve our wider mission of being the world's first public service broadcaster. 
And this was a really exciting opportunity for us to help shape that vision. We knew we needed to create a new, coherent, consistent, and sophisticated BBC.com and app experience. So the premise of this talk is really just to look at some of the challenges we faced on a project of this scale, how we solved them, and importantly, what we learned along the way. So firstly, how does a design team collaborate when separated by 3,500 miles and working in different time zones? How do we keep the hundreds, and there were hundreds of stakeholders up to speed with what we were doing, and importantly, happy? As a design team, how do we create and build and then stay on top of a design system that seems to be growing exponentially with no sign of slowing down? And how do you take a fundamentally institutionally British product and make design decisions that make it relevant for a global audience? So where did we start? Um, well, contrary to what you might think, the design team working within this highly matrix kind of global company were very, very small, quite new, and we basically had to evolve how we were working quite quickly. Um, we joked that we were like a little startup in this 100-year-old behemoth as an, as an organization. Um, so we really need to take steps to open up our creative thinking to enable us to collaborate efficiently and really sell our vision to those stakeholders and ultimately the general public. I'm sure many of us are used to operating as a creative team in a corporate environment, and often that comes with being treated or maybe perceived as a delivery commodity or a kind of service department. Well, uniquely for us, we were actually at the beginning of the reimagining of the business. So that meant we weren't just applying a new design treatment to the product experience, but really intrinsic to the strategic thinking that helps shape the foundational thinking of the products. We all know that designers are problem solvers, so a principle we applied throughout the project, and especially in our briefing, was to treat things as challenges and not deliverables. So one thing was clear from the very, very start of the project. We wanted to hear everyone's voices, everyone's thoughts, everyone's opinions. So we opened up what we called concept storming sessions, you can see behind me. And these were huge, infinite boards open to anyone, product owners, journalists, content commissioners, designers, development, management, everyone in between. And basically, we just wanted to hear everyone's ideas of what this product could be. Those experiences we felt had legs, we would then put in front of the public for testing. And that would range from kind of seasoned BBC users right through to complete newbies who had absolutely no idea who the BBC were. Um, and why was this important? Well, it meant that from the get-go, the design team weren't just working in a silo and thinking alone. And also, it was very important that we felt those people who were going to be fundamental in bringing this project together later on had their voices heard at this very early stage. So having gone through that arguably more fun part of the process, um, intense ideation, we really needed some decisions to be able to move forward with delivering a tangible product and being able to start illustrating how this actually might come to life. So you might think that a common use of high-fidelity high prototyping was like nearing handover in a design process to illustrate to developers functionality or kind of just demonstrate your thinking in design. However, we needed something that would really help us reimagine the complicated part of this business coming to life. We needed to be able to demonstrate how this could all come together to reassure our stakeholders that the project was moving in the right direction, to get strategic decisions on really complicated parts of the project actually made, to get some early user feedback on some of those initial design ideas, and more importantly, obtain funding. So this high fidelity prototype that you see helped us get the project off the ground. But what's kind of interesting to note is it actually looks nothing like our final design decisions or MVP product. You might argue that we weren't doing a very good job if it did. Um, so like our audience here today, like you guys, um, our design team was distributed across different geographies, different disciplines, and that came with some predictable um, results and also some unconventional challenges. Um, like how Laura and I crafted this talk today, we use a wide range of tools and technologies, and as did our design team, to basically ensure everyone could produce their best work. Now, for a project of this magnitude, as I mentioned before, our design team is actually pretty tiny. Um, and this was actually quite intentional. You can see that we're split relatively evenly between the US and the UK. And we knew that having a kind of bloated, excessively large design team was going to, make, was going to mean things like decision making was going to take too long. Things would get lost in translation, lost in communication. The upshot of being quite a small and nimble team meant that 
Decisions made on one platform, like web, for example, could very quickly and efficiently be um, moved over to another platform, like mobile app. And yeah, it kind of worked well. But as the project progressed, the, this team makeup worked OK. But then as things got more complex, as more stakeholders were going to get being involved, we kind of really needed some help. So at that point, we brought in a design manager. And they basically just took care of all of the admin for the design team and essentially enabled the design team to do what they did best. They, they organized the meetings, organized sign-off, approvals, that sort of thing. And similarly, and this is a common theme through the project, as we started to get more into the details of the components on the page, we noticed that the language that we were using really became a focal point. And British terminology that Laura and I wouldn't even think twice about using would make absolutely no sense to an international audience. So at that point, we brought in a UX writer. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on. So given the distribution of our team that Sam mentioned, with half the team in London and half the team in New York, it was quite rare that we got to be in a room together. I think that only happened maybe once or twice throughout the entirety of the project. However, we're in a post-pandemic world. We're all used to collaborating digitally and working together on Zoom. But the challenge we faced was actually our time zones. The practical work crossovers were only really three hours. And th they often got filled with meetings of <laughs> more corporate varieties. So that meant it was really tough to fit all of our creative conversation and design chat into one day. And not least taking into account that, obviously, creative energy doesn't necessarily always fit into a nine to five window. So as a team, we generally use too many platforms for our conversation, whether that's Slack, Teams, WhatsApp, email, or sometimes even Instagram. But we really needed a space to be able to give design direction and feedback that was really relevant to the work that the team were doing. So being able to comment directly on designs gave us the opportunity to feedback to the team and ask questions on pieces of design work that were really relevant and specific. And we didn't get confusion around which typographic style we were talking about or which element of functionality. But mostly, it actually really made us able to make use of that weird time zone crossover. So I could leave a comment in the early hours in the, in the early evening in the US, and the London design team had already actioned it for when I woke up in the morning. They might tell you that further facilitated my backseat driving. <laughs> so you'd like to think after two and a half years on a project, we would have our design process fairly well locked down. But no, that wasn't really the case. Um, you've probably seen a design process that looks something like this or a variation of this, and, and this has served the digital design community very, very well, and it did for us to a certain extent. But as the project progressed and as things got more complicated, um, something was happening. Important checkpoints were being missed, uh, requirements being misplaced. This is especially true when we went from the kind of big picture thinking like page types and navigations to the much more granular. So we moved to something that looks more like this. And you're probably thinking this looks far too over-engineered, way too complicated. And to a certain extent, you'd be right. But the fact is, we were actually doing many of these steps before. We just simply weren't acknowledging them. For example, the concepting workshop. We didn't need to have a concepting workshop for every single design sprint. But it meant just having it there as a checkpoint meant if we did need it, we had plenty of time to get it organized and get the right people in the room. And ultimately, this kind of convoluted process basically stopped anything from slipping through the cracks or basically falling off the radar. So how did all of these principles culminate in design decisions that started to make up our MVP experience? I don't need to tell you that digital content is constantly evolving and moving, but news especially is so rarely static that we knew our product couldn't be either. We needed to design for a world where we, the way we told our stories to users could adapt and flex depending on the context. So we need to ensure that whatever we were designing was scalable, reusable, adaptable, and probably most importantly, context sensitive. At the same time, we need to be very, very conscious that we weren't just designing for the consumers of the app and the website, but also an entire editorial and curation team at the BBC, as well as um, those in the commercial arm with regards to ads and sponsorship. So we decided to build the product out of basically a, a whole series of components that allowed the curators to establish a level of pace and hierarchy in their storytelling. We knew that stories would need different levels of weight and different levels of prominence, so we delivered these through a series of content cards. 
So the variety of design treatment we applied to these content cards, whether that was through size and scale of typography or use and prominence of imagery, really gave us this flexible card system which allowed us to represent stories from the small scale all the way through to the next big breaking news piece and everything in between all the time maintaining the consistent look and feel we knew we needed to keep build that association with the wider brand. And those cards we arranged in a series of content templates to really set the context of that particular story on the page. And when you start adding more content into there, you can start to see that kind of variety and uh, hierarchy come to life. And then at a moment's notice, the whole thing can be transformed when a breaking news story hits. Everything else can be deprioritized. That new story can take center stage. And really, this kind of demonstrates how powerful this level of flexibility can be. So how did we organize all of this? With now dozens of collections that editors could choose from to build these pages and templates, we needed something simple and memorable to stop this getting confusing. So therefore, the collections of cards we named after US states. And this was an idea that we applied both across the design system, but as well the editorial CMS. And all of those individual content cards that make up those collections, we named after UK cities, towns, and counties. And this approach of using distinct, easy to remember, non-technical naming conventions meant that it was really easy to keep track of all of these through the design and development process. And as a bonus, really helped our kind of cross-cultural geographic education as well. A little bit. Um, another cultural quirk that we faced as a British organization taking a product to a global audience with our team distributed across the US and the UK was through language and communication. Now that might seem a bit surprising, right, because we all speak the same language, but there were nuances we had to overcome in order to both operate effectively as a team and also communicate clearly to our audiences. Even things as simple as delivery dates became a challenge. As I learned, we write our dates differently in the US to the UK. So was it due on the 4th of May or the 5th of April? On a lighter note, even during design discussions, we often needed help translating our strange turn of the <laughs> phrase. But more importantly, in our UX writing, we needed to ensure our language wasn't too nuanced and made sense to that global audience. Journalistically and editorially, we adopt British English. But in our functional and instructional text, we needed to be really careful that we weren't being too jovial or sarcastic, too regional, or, God forbid, overly polite. <laughs> now, Laura mentioned earlier how important prototyping and Figma was at the start of the project. What continued to prove invaluable, and still does to this day, actually, is the work stream to create and maintain what we call the diamond prototype. And this kind of living, breathing, fully interactive prototype was basically created for all devices that grew and evolved from the moment we had production-ready assets. Um, this complex, fully interactive showcase is basically the source of truth for so many people. For the design team, it was a great way to show how their newly designed components would sit uh, in the wider context of the site or the app. For the ad sales team, it was a great tool for marketing ad and sponsorship spaces for pages that hadn't even been built yet. For senior stakeholders, it was a fantastic way to represent the product roadmap really being brought to life. And crucially, from a developer's perspective, it was a fantastic visual reference for all of the dozens of cards and collections we looked at earlier. Now, Sam and I could have taken a very long time talking about every aspect of delivering this massive project and all the complexities and complications that came with that, whether it was the fast turnaround times and the wild deadlines we faced, navigating that complex globally distributed team, managing those non-creative stakeholders, and arguably most importantly, building a huge yet effective design system that started to make up our MVP product. But ultimately, the products you see live today do genuinely reflect our original design ambition, and that's to bring great storytelling to a more, in a more relevant, coherent, and sophisticated way to a global audience. And in true MVP fashion, this is really just the beginning of our design ambition. Live in five, four, three. This is BBC News. The news headlines this morning. You are incredibly influential. Why? People are going to see what happened there. 
In our connected world, all news is international. Everybody's got a story. The BBC's been granted exclusive access. Content that comes closest to the red line. 